So let's say you decide to buy stock in a company, not just any company, but a company that's losing money, that you expect to keep losing money in the future, and has a lot of debt. Essentially a basket case company. You might wonder, why would I want to do that? For the same reasons you buy a deep out of the money option. Most of the time you're going to lose all the money you invested, but some of the time you're going to make an incredible return. That's the basis for investing in equity in a deeply troubled company. You're investing in an option. In this session, I hope to expand on that concept and look at the implications for investors. These last three sessions, we've talked about using option pricing in the context of valuation. We've talked about using option pricing to value a young biotechnology company, natural resource company. In the last session, we talked about using option pricing to value the option to expand and abandon. This session, I want to wrap things up. I want to talk about a very specific case where option pricing can be your ally in valuing equity. Step back. Think about buying equity in a publicly traded company. Here's what you get. You get a share of ownership in the company, obviously. You get to run the company. You also get limited liability. You know what that means, right? The company gets into trouble. You can lose what you paid for the equity in the company, but you cannot be held responsible for anything more. Your stock price can get to zero, but it cannot become negative. So you run the company, you have limited liability, and you have the choice, though you might not use it in most companies, to liquidate the company anytime you want. You think, so what? Well, if I use that limited liability and the right you have to liquidate together, I have the makings of an option. And here's why. Let's assume a firm, you have a, you're the equity investor in a firm with a value V. Again, let's use abstractions for the moment, and then we'll flesh them out. Let's assume you have some debt outstanding in the firm, and that debt has a value D. If the value of the business exceeds the debt, then when you liquidate the firm, you get the difference, V minus D. If the value of the firm is less than the outstanding debt, remember, you have limited liability, so you have zero as your cash flow. That looks very much like a call option to me. If you replace V with S, which is the standard term for the value of the underlying asset, and D with K, you have the makings of a call option. So let's draw the payoff diagram on equity in a publicly traded company and the option to liquidate. If you liquidate a firm as the equity investor, you're going to look at the value of the assets in liquidation. If the value of the asset in the liquidation exceeds the face value of the debt, then you get to keep the difference as the equity investor. If the value of the assets is less than the face value of the debt, then nothing. You lose what you originally paid to buy the shares in the company. That is the insight we're going to use to value equity in deeply distressed companies. What are deeply distressed companies? Deeply distressed companies are companies that are losing money, that you expect to lose money in the foreseeable future and have a lot of debt. Those companies are in trouble, right? The trouble they face is they potentially could run into not being able to pay, make those debt payments and liquidate. So let's try this with some real numbers. Let's assume you have a business that you valued at $100 million. I don't know how you came up with the value. You might have estimated discounted cash flow value. You might have used a relative value. But for the moment, let's assume that's what you would get if you liquidated the assets of the company. Let's also assume that this company has only one zero coupon bond outstanding with a 10-year maturity and an $80 million face value. Finally, let's, fi let's also assume that the value that you estimated of $100 million has a variance slash standard deviation associated with it. Your estimate is that that standard deviation is 40% and that the riskless rate is 10%. So that's all you know. You know the value of the business. You know the face value of the debt. You know it's a 10-year zero coupon bond. You know the riskless rate is 10%. And you know that the standard deviation of the value is 40%. That doesn't sound like much information. But I'm going to argue that with that information and an option pricing view of the world, you should be able to tell me how much the equity in this business is worth and what interest rate you would charge on the debt. To set up this process, I'm going to think about all these numbers in terms of inputs into an option pricing model. And remember, the option I'm valuing here is the option to liquidate you own as the equity investor. The value of the underlying asset, 100 million, becomes the equivalent of S in the model. The face value of the debt, 80 million, becomes a strike price for the model. That's what you will have to pay if you decide to liquidate the company. You have 10 years to play this game. Why only 10 years? Because at the end of the 10th year, the bondholder slash bank gets a power to liquidate you without you doing much. So for the next nine years and 364 days, you get the exclusive rights to run this company or liquidate the company. 
Now you might see why I made it a zero coupon bond. On a regular bond or a regular bank loan, you have interest payments due every six months, every three months, every year, and the power shifts at that point in time. So if you have a regular bond, rather than having one 10-year option, you have a series of six-month options rolling onto each other. Doesn't change the intuition, but makes the process much more complicated. For the variance in the value, I'm going to take the 0.4, the 40% standard deviation and square it. The variance I'm going to end up with is 0.16, and the riskless rate is 10%. I have all the inputs I need to value the option. I plug them into my option pricing model. Again, I won't go through the details of the model, but I use the black shows. And the value that I get for the call option here is 75.94 million. You say, what does that mean? If I view equity in this company as an option, it's worth 75.94 million. The overall value of the company is 100 million. Subtracting out the equity value gives me a value for the debt of 24.06 million. Remember that's a zero coupon bond, 100 million in face value, 24.06 million is my is, is, the, is, the mar is the market value of the bond today. With those two numbers, I can back into an interest rate I would charge on the bond of 12.77%. So here's the magic. With the limited information you gave me, I'm able to give you what the value of equity in the company is, 75.94 million, and also tell you that a default spread that you should be charging for your debt should be 2.77%. But don't get too caught up in the mathematics here. When you view equity as a call option, some very interesting implications emerge. Let's take one. Let's assume you wake up tomorrow to catastrophic news. Half your business has disappeared. Remember it was worth 100 million? Now it's worth only 50 million. I know what happened to it. Maybe it got wiped out. Your equity is going to drop in value, obviously, but think about how much it's going to drop in value too. It used to be worth 75.94 million yesterday, right? Before the catastrophe. You've lost a half, half of the firm, and that was 50 million. Now you'd normally say, well, I'll subtract out the 50 million from the 75.94 million. My new value for the equity should be 25.94 million. Technically, you might be right, but I think you might be missing something if you do that. And here's what you're missing. You still have an option, right? Let's go back and revalue the option with new inputs. And here's what the numbers will look like for the new inputs. Most of the option pricing model remains intact. The strike price, the life of the option, the riskless rate, even the standard deviation, because after all, the business is still the business and the standard deviation is a percentage value. The one number that's changed is the value of the underlying business. Instead of 100 million, I get 50 million. I plug the numbers in and I value the option. I get a new value for the equity of 30.44 million. That's a drop of 45 and a half million from my 75.94, but it's a drop of only 45 and a half. Remember the value of the business dropped by 50 million. You're saying, who else is bearing, bearing the loss? Well, the answer is simple. There's only one other player in the game, and that's a lender. The debt that used to be worth 24.06 million is now worth 19.56 million. My interest rate has gone up. The value of my debt has gone down. My lenders are bearing some of my loss. You might wonder what's, what follows from this. But here's a very simple follow-up. I took this company and kept dropping the value of the business from 50 million to 40 to 30 to 20 to 10 while keeping the debt as is, an $80 million, 10-year zero coupon bond. You know what I was trying to find out? When does equity in a publicly traded company become worth nothing? When does it become worthless? And the answer is almost never. In this example, at least, I kept lowering the value to two million, a half a million, while keeping the debt intact, and the equity hung in there. Equity is an incredibly stubborn instrument, but think of what's keeping the value intact. It's a combination of two things. One is time, and the other is hope. You have 10 years to play this game, and as long as you have 10 years to play the game, the equity will not become worthless. The implications are very interesting. When you look at stock in publicly traded companies, especially when these companies are in deep trouble, don't expect the stock price to go to zero. You will see stock prices stay above zero. And the value of equity there can be estimated and explained primarily as an option, which means if you're gonna buy equity in a deeply distressed company, please make sure that that deeply distressed company is not a stable distressed company. You want to make bets here. You want volatility. You want risk to be your ally. 
You want to buy equity in deeply distressed companies that are in volatile businesses, risky businesses, because that's what's going to save you. So let's say you decide to apply this approach to valuing equity in a real company. I have some suggestions on how you can get the inputs for that real company. The first input you need is a value for the underlying assets. And there are two ways you can get that. One is to do a discounted cash flow valuation of the assets. And if you do, be careful. Don't estimate a growth rate. Do, in a sense, a conservative discounted cash flow valuation. Value the existing assets based on their existing cash flows. If you decide to do a relative valuation, you're going to apply an EBITDA multiple. Make sure that multiple reflects only existing assets. Go on the low end rather than the high end. So that's going to be the equivalent of S in your model. For the strike price, you need a face value for the debt. I don't think you're going to find too many deeply distressed companies with one zero coupon bond. So here's the game you should pay. Take all of the debt outstanding at the company, add up the face value of all of the debt. In fact, add the coupons as well. Treat it as the face value of a zero coupon bond. For the maturity of the debt, take a weighted average of the maturities of all of the debt you have outstanding. I know it's cheating, but it's going to get you closer to the real answer. Put those numbers in as the equivalent of a zero coupon bond. So what you're essentially doing is taking the consolidated debt in your company and converting it into one zero coupon bond with a face value equal to the face values of all of the debt you have outstanding, the maturity being the average maturity across all of that debt. For the variance in the value of the business, there are two choices. One is you can use past stock prices and bond prices for your company, but that's a messy way to go. The other is to use the industry average variances. I have those on my website, so if you have a troubled steel company, use the average variance for steel companies. Plug that in, and you're almost home. Use those inputs in your option pricing model, and you're going to get a value for an equity in a deeply distressed company. I'm not suggesting any of these inputs are going to be simple, but it's going to give you some insights that are still worth having. So in summary, when we normally value equity, we value it based on the cash flows or based on, on other assets that look just like our assets. We either use discounted cash flow models or relative valuation models. Sometimes, though, if you're valuing equity in a troubled firm, it might pay for you to think of it as an option and value it as such.